So if we're going to talk about attaining God and using Karma Yoga as a way of attaining God or reaching God, then the first question that needs to be answered is why would someone want to attain God? Once we understand that, then we may decide to embark First of all, why does somebody want to attain God? Or why would anybody want to attain God? Another. 
So your true self cannot be that which is left behind. <laughs> Otherwise, you would be changing in every life, but you are not changing. Your soul, meaning you, leaves this temporary, uh, this is like a mask we wear, nothing more, a disguise we wear for our soul. Because you can't see the soul, so the soul resides in the body, and then we see the body, and we think, well, that's this person. Or we look at the mirror and we think, that's me. But it's not. It's, it's like thinking that this shawl is me. It's not. It's just what I'm wearing. It's what's covering me. So the soul leaves and goes and takes another body, but you remain the same because you are the soul. Your looks change in every life. Your body changes, but you don't change. Gita also says, that when the soul leaves the body, the mind and senses, man and five senses, go with the soul to the next body. So your personality is preserved. Because soul and mind together go to the next body. But the soul itself is the original divine spark, spark of divinity. And it is anch of God. This is what Krishna says, Mamai Vancho Jiva. All the Jeev, Mama Eva. They are my anch only, Mamai Vancha. Sanatana, they are eternally my anch. So here we learn something more about the soul. So far we knew that that's our true identity. Yet, can't be seen. We can't see our own soul. But we don this body, therefore we can see something. Yet the soul resides in the body. And when it leaves the body, the soul does not die. The body is left behind. And we take another body, but in every life we have the same identity. That we are the divine soul, and we are the same we have been since eternity, since uncountable lifetimes. And we are Anj of Shri Krishna. Anj is a very, uh, you can say there's a lot of philosophy packed into this little word. Anj taken literally means a part of or a piece of. So you can say we are all part of God. But God cannot be broken into pieces. Like, say we have certain amount of water in this water bottle and it could be scattered into drops. So with each drop that you take out, the original amount is reducing. So if you think of souls as a part of God, like a drop of the ocean, God is the unlimited ocean, then every soul that comes out of God is reducing the amount of the original. So it's not completely correct to say that we're a part of God because God can't be made less. And we are not just a part taken out of God. We are of God. Shankaracharya says, Satya Vipeta Agni Nath Tavaham Nama All the waves arise out of the ocean. 
Vajana Samudro Na Taranga The ocean does not come out of the wave So the ocean does not exist dependent on the waves But the waves are dependent on the ocean for their existence Similarly, I depend on you for my existence Because you are the life of my life We were just singing Mero Pyaro Pyaro Murali Varo Oh Krishna plays the flute you are my anchi, and I am your anch. So we say, Sabha prani nija pranam pyare. The most dear thing to every living being is their own soul. But, priyatama pranam te pyare. Priyatam means Sri Krishna. He is even more dear to us than our own soul because he is the soul of our soul. Our soul is our true self which gives life to our body. So what could be more dear to us than our own soul? The one who gives life to our soul is even more dear to us. So he is called Paramatma. Or another way of describing this relationship is he is our Anshi and we are his Anj. So how many Anj does he have? Unlimited. Ansho Nana Vyapade Shat Brahma Sutra. There's no limit to the number of souls, but they all get their life from God. So God as Paramatma resides in the soul, in right inside everybody's soul. Yasyedam Shariram Ved says Just like your soul resides in your body So this is the body of your soul Krishna resides in your soul So it's as if your soul is his body It's one way of understanding the relationship So imagine how deep is our relationship with Krishna When he is the very life of our soul and he's been here forever, giving life to us. He's never left us, no matter what yoni we've been born into. We've been born as a dog, cat, deer, insect, fish, bacterium, human beings. We've been around the cycle of 8.4 million species of existence uncountable times because we are Sanatana. We never began. Yet God never left us, even for a second. So we have such a deep relationship with Him. He is completely and totally ours. So much so that there's no separation between us and Him. He inhabits us. So we don't have to go far to find Him. So the reason I'm explaining all of this to you is because I ask the question, why do we want God? Or, more specifically, why do we say every soul is completely dedicated to God, is an exclusive devotee of God? So this is part of the explanation. Part of it is understanding that we are His Anj. The second part is understanding the nature of that Anj and Anchi relationship. Take an example in the world. A clump of dirt. Let's say this is a clump of dirt that I've picked up from the earth. This is like Anj and the earth is Anchi. So there's a natural attraction between the Anj and the Anchi. The only reason it's separate is because I'm holding it separate. If I release it, it immediately is pulled towards its Anchi. So there's a nat you can say there's a natural love that the Anj has for its Anchi. It's inborn natural. It's our Swabha. It means what is your swabhav does not have to be taught to you. The anj just has an inherent attraction for its anj. So since we are anj of Bhagwan, 
which means that he is the one who gives life to us. We are a fraction of his power. We belong to him. Therefore, our very soul desires God. In fact, we cannot desire anything but God. Even if someone is Gnostic, a proclaimed atheist, and says, I do not believe in God, I do not desire God, I have nothing to do with God. Yet, I would assert that even that person desires only God, despite what they may think. The reason is one more secret told to us by our divine scriptures. Understand it this way. Let's say you ask that person, okay, you don't want God. I, I accept what you're saying, but tell me, what do you want? He may say, uh, I want to have a nice loving family. I want to have lots of friends. I want to become rich. I want to be healthy. I want to be successful, appreciated, respected. I want to become famous. Whatever it may be, he may say some of these things, all of these things. So you say, okay, these are common desires. But answer me this, why do you want those things? Why do you want wealth? Why do you want health? Why do you want family? Why do you have these desires? He'll say, well, having wealth allows me to buy things, do things, go places. Yes, but why do you want that? Well, doing those things, going those places, buying those things makes me happy. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. So you want to be happy. And that's the only reason you want those other things. Yes. Why do you want a nice family? Why do you want friends? Why do you want their love? Because their affection makes you happy. So really, the only thing you want is happiness. You could say that. Nobody wants anything other than happiness. Could anyone desire to be unhappy? No. Even if someone desires to finish their life and commit suicide, why are they doing it? They think that they're just, they have so much trouble in this life. They're not finding enough happiness. Better to just put an end to their suffering, and through that they'll find happiness. So even if someone is committing suicide, it's out of their desire to be happy. Even if someone is crying, you might say, "How could? why would someone cry if our goal is to find happiness? The same reason. Why do we cry? When that suffering is too much and it's burning our heart, then we cry and those tears cool our heart and make us feel better. So we even cry to feel happy. We laugh to feel happy. Everything we do is for happiness. So that atheist would also accept that yes, everything I do is for happiness. Okay, now the final piece of the puzzle is this. Can we please have a definition of God from the Vedas? There's a wonderful story told in Taittiriya Upanishad that one day Bhrigu, who is one of the eternal rishis of this earth planet, he came to his father Varun and asked, can you please tell me about Brahm? Tell me about God. Bhrigu vai varuni varunam pitaramupa sasara adhi bhagavo brahmane. Please tell me about God. So his father said, Yato va imani bhutani jayante yena jatani jivanti yat prayantya visam vishanti tad brahma vijityasasva. He answered in the form of a riddle. He said, Brahma is that from which the whole universe and all the souls come, in whom all of this is currently existing or residing, and into whom all of that emerges. That is Brahma. Then he said to his son, 
Sata Kota Petra, Sata Basta Ba. Now go and do sadhana. Because I gave you, you know, the explanation I gave you is, is a theoretical explanation. You have to experience it. So you go, do devotion, and then you come back and tell me when you have the answer. So he went and he did sadhana. And he came back after a long time. He said, Father, I think I have an answer. He said, Annam Brahmeti Dijana. You'll be interested to see his progression of understanding the definition of God. He said, okay, God is the one from whom we all come, in whom we reside, and into whom we return. So he said, I think Anna is Brahma, grain, like uh, rice, wheat. So his father remained silent, he didn't say anything. So Brigu explained that, uh, well, when you eat the grain, it is converted by your body into fluid, which is absorbed by, by your bloodstream. Then that is converted into other forms, like it, it becomes part of your blood, or it, become, it turns into muscle tissue, or it becomes bone, or it becomes uh, reproductive fluid. Then that reproductive fluid is combined mother's reproductive fluid, the father's reproductive fluid combines and then a new organism is born. And then they grow up and they eat the anna and that nourishes them and then in the end when, that, when the body dies what happens? It decomposes, it goes back into the earth and then it's absorbed eventually by more plants and again it becomes anna. So father, according to your definition, God must be food stuff. That must be the definition of God. His father remained silent. So Brigu understood that, I guess he didn't get the right answer. <laughs> so he went back and he did more sadhana. The next time he returned, he had a deeper understanding. And he said, Father, Prano Brahmeti Pijana. See, first his answer was purely physical. This time he said, Father, God is Pran, the life force of the body. His father remained silent. He went and did more sadhana. He came back and he said, Mano Brahmi Dijana. See, man, or your antakara, your, your own mind, is more subtle than the life force, the Pran. So this time he said, Man is Brahma. His father remained silent. He went and did more sadhana. He returned and he said, Vigyanam Brahmi Dijana. Here, Vigyan means Atma, the soul. Father, the soul is Brahma. His father still remained silent. He went back and he did more sadhana. The fifth and final time he returned and he said, Ananda Brahmi Dijana. Ananda Deva Khandimani Bhutani Jayante Yena Jatani Jeevanti Yat Prayantya Visam Vishanti Tad Brahma. Father, Anand is Brahma. Anand means perfect bliss. His father nodded in a sense. He said, Yes, my son, now we have understood the true nature of Brahma. Brahm is Anand. What is Anand? Anand means unlimited happiness, perfect bliss, everlasting, unlimited, beyond disturbance of any kind. That is perfect happiness. That's called Anand. And that Anand is another name for God. So we didn't just define God, we understood more about the nature of God. That God is the form of happiness. See, just like if you say, there is sweetness in sugar. That's incorrect. 
If we say God is blissful, that's incorrect. There is not bliss in God, just like there's not sweetness in sugar. Sugar itself is the form of sweetness. You see, if sweetness were one thing and sugar were another, then you could separate the two, or honey and sweetness. But you can't separate them. You can't put sweetness over here and sugar over here, and then combine them. They are one and the same. Sugar is the form of sweetness. Similarly, God is the form of Anam. God is happiness. It's just two names for the same thing. So the point of all of this was to explain to you that if someone says, I want happiness, they are saying, I want God. Because happiness is God. And the only reason we desire happiness is because we are anch of Bhagavan. Remember I explained that every anch desires his anchi? So if you ask someone that what do you want, and he gets to that point where he says, the only thing I want is happiness, then ask him, why do you want happiness? Unless he's a pundit or a scholar of the Vedas or Gita, he won't have an answer for you. Why? He'll think, why are you, why are you asking me why I want happiness? Everybody wants happiness. There's no why. No, there is a why. There's a reason. The reason we want happiness is because God is happiness and we are His anch, and every anch naturally desires His anchi. So there's a scientific reason why we desire happiness. Every anch desires His anchi, and our anchi happens to be Bhagavan Shri Krishna, who is Himself the form of happiness. So it's completely natural, in fact, it's impossible for someone not to desire happiness, or you could say it's impossible for someone not to desire God. So we are eternally related to the form of perfect happiness. Think about that. All our relations in this world are temporary. Temporary and also imperfect. No one in this world can love us perfectly. No one in this world can look out only for our happiness. We all have our own happiness in mind. We want people to do things and go places and behave in a certain way according to what makes us happy. And if they don't follow what we want, then our love for them decreases. But our relationship with God is not based on such self-interest because God is already whole and complete. So He is perfect love. He is perfect bliss. And He is totally powerless. So for these two reasons, we want God. Number one, He is ours. We have an eternal relationship. And He's the only one that we have that relationship with. And secondly, He is the form of happiness, and if we attain Him, we'll get that happiness. Taitariya Upanishad further says that He is Ras. Ras is another name for Anand. He is Ras, and only by attaining Him can a soul become Anandi. Anandi means blissful. See, He is Anand. Anando, Ananda. He is Anand, and we will become Anandi. Just like Dhan and Dhani. So, Dhan is the wealth, and the one who gets the wealth becomes Dhani. So, God is Anand, and if we get Him, we'll become Anandi, we'll become blissful forever. So, this is why we desire God, because we desire bliss, we want to be happy forever, and we just happen to be eternally related to the form of divine bliss. If you found out, let's say you thought you were totally alone, a single living relative. And then you found out that, oh no, I have a brother living in another country that I didn't know about, I didn't 
know he existed, but somehow you find out that there, I have one other living relative. How viacal would you be to meet your only living relative? I thought I was alone in this whole world. Now I found out I have a brother or a sister or something like that. You would immediately take a vacation, get on a plane, and go and meet your one living relative. The desire to meet someone that we're related to is very deep in our heart. Now consider that our only divine relationship is with God. All of the relationships of this world are physical. They're based on a physical situation. The body you received in this life grew in your mother's stomach. And that mother and that father became your mother and father in this life. But in your past life you had a different mother and father. They were not your mother and father in your past life. So every relationship that you currently enjoy in this world will one day end. That's the nature of worldly existence. Yet, you have one divine relationship. Divine means eternal. That relationship can never be cut. It will never end. Even if you forget him, he won't forget you. It's that deep of a relationship. Even if you forget him for a million lifetimes, he'll never leave you. He'll always be with you. Yet, we've never met him face to face. So why doesn't that bother us? Because we don't understand the nature. We think, oh, I have a mother, I have a father, I have friends and relatives. But we don't realize that these are all temporary. Our one divine relationship is with Krishna. So if we understand that, then we would get that Vyakulupa. Just like you would feel if you thought that you were alone in the world and then you found out you do have one living relative. So we are exclusively related to Krishna. If someone understands that, then they'll naturally desire to meet him. If you feel that my only divine eternal relationship is with Sri Krishna, if you realize that, then you can't help but want to meet him. So this is our desire for God. That desire is there already on a soul level, but in the mind is a different thing. The mind receives that feeling, that desire for God, yet interprets it differently depending on its state of purity or impurity. Every soul is desiring for God, or you can say every soul is desiring for divine happiness, or to meet His divine beloved. But the mind doesn't always understand it in that way. We just feel that inner lack. We do feel that vyakulpa, that restlessness. But we may interpret it as a desire for the world. We, we look to the world as a source of happiness, when actually God is the very form of happiness. And the world actually isn't the form of happiness, it's just the world. It gives you some comfort and enjoyment, but it never gives you permanent happiness. It's like an itch. If you have an itch and you scratch it, you get momentary relief, but the itch comes back worse than it was before. That's like trying to enjoy the world. You feel a desire, and then you itch it. That means you got some worldly thing and you enjoy it. But then that desire just comes back stronger than it was before. The restlessness you felt comes back stronger than it was before. So you're still discontented and dissatisfied no matter how much of this world you enjoy. This is the nature of worldly enjoyment. But the nature of God's happiness is paripurata, to, be, to feel whole, complete, and content. So that is our true desire, yet because the world is right here in front of us, that inner desire for God gets distorted into a desire for worldly happiness. And then we go on enjoying the world and multiplying our worldly desires and attachments. And in that process, 
process, we forget about God altogether. It's like our heart gets completely clouded by all the worldly desire and attachment to the point where we don't even realize our eternal divine relationship with God. But if the mind gets the right knowledge, oh, that desire I feel that's actually a desire for God, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> I am the soul. I am divine. And God is divine. So God's divine happiness could satisfy my divine soul. And this world is only material. So you can only get temporary material enjoyments. That can never satisfy my divine soul. Oh, okay. Then I must desire for God. So the knowledge can uh, clarify the purpose of our existence. That's the necessity of spiritual knowledge. It teaches us why are we here and how can we attain the ultimate goal of our life. So the ultimate goal of every soul is to meet their eternal divine mother and father and friend, Shri Krishna. That's the eternal goal of every soul. And when you do that, you will receive perfect divine happiness. So I explained all of this to you tonight because I'm going to talk to you about the path to God. So before we talk about the path to God or how to attain God, we have to understand why do we want to attain God. So I explained that to you tonight, why every soul desires only God. Those who say they don't desire God are just confused. They haven't understood that their inner desire for for happiness is actually the desire for God. And those with correct knowledge realize, oh, this inner feeling I have, that is a longing for divine happiness, and that can be satisfied by attaining God. So now, having understood this, we're ready to hear about the path to God. Now, the path to God has been explained as being threefold. Yoga Astray Maya Prota Nirinam Shreyo Vidhitsaya Yanam Karman Chabhaktishcha No Payam Yusti Uttrajit In the Bhagavatam, Shri Krishna tells Uthauji that there are only three paths to my attainment. He says, Nrinam Nishreya. Nishreya means your ultimate goal, your ultimate happiness. So Sri Krishna says there are only three ways of attaining that ultimate happiness. Karma, Jnana, and Bhakti. Three paths for all the ages. These are three eternal paths. There can be no fourth path. No by own Nyosti Putrajit. Sri Krishna says there can never be a fourth or fifth path. There can only be these three. Karma, Jnana, and Bhakti. So why only these three? I'll explain to you tomorrow. And then from there we'll focus on the path of Karma Yoga as we go forward. So in the rest of this series I'll be explaining the practical aspects of Karma Yoga. Understanding what is karma yoga? So out of these three, karma, jnana, and bhakti, why are we going to focus on karma or karma yoga? What is karma yoga? How do we practice karma yoga in our life? And what benefit do we get if we do practice that? We'll understand all of these practical aspects according to the teachings of the Gita. Continuing tomorrow.